The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, void bugs decide to open a fast food chain on Haley's Comet. FDA regulators try long pork and oddly enough find it delicious. Even if the chewy bits sing when the blunt moon is high in the squid speckled sky. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I am the Bain Summer intern, Jonathan Graubert, having successfully performed a coup. No, no, Tony Daniel has actually placed a Damocles sword directly above my head. And if I make one misstep during the entire podcast, well, best not to think about those consequences. This time, we have a roundtable discussion of the annual Year's Best Military and Adventure Sci-Fi, Volume 4, that is out now at Booksellers. The discussion includes deep insights and an Armenian hairdresser caught in the middle of an alien conspiracy. Included in the pod are anthology editor David of Sharirod, Martin Shoemaker, Brian Trent, Casey Ezel, Suzanne Palmer, and Tony Daniel who is, again, with the sword. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Leiden Universe novel, Alliance of Equals. Now, here's the news. Another June means new mass market paperback stampede out of the corrals and head for bookseller shelves. Out now in mass market is The Black Wolves of Boston by Wen Spencer. Rebuild a life, save a city. A vampire struggling to find his purpose, a virtue, pledged to hunt evil but unable to live alone in a city of strangers who know nothing about monsters. A 16-year-old ward of the Wolf King. A college-bound high school student senior whose life is shattered when he wakes up in a field covered in blood. These four must come together to unravel a plot by wickers, witches who gain power from human sacrifices and have the power to turn any human into their puppet. Four people who have lost everything must struggle to save Boston by saving each other. Also out in all its mass market glory is Blood Enemies by Susan R. Matthews. To end a genocidal menace, a retired torturer must again take up his hated trade. Andre Kuskusko is a former fleet medical officer for the enormous totalitarian star re- empire, the Jurisdiction. But when he served in the fleet, Andre's real job was not medicine, but to act as a torturer. Years ago, he left that life behind. But now, the Angel of Death, a savage terrorist organization, means to capture the system he calls home. The only way to bring down an organization that has slain whole systems of men, women, and children is for Andre to embrace the savagery in his own heart and once again take on the role of judicial torturer. The Black Wolves of London by Wen Spencer and Blood Enemies by Susan R. Matthews are now available in mass market format at booksellers everywhere. Welcome to the Bain Podcast. I am Jonathan Grauber, the still alive Bain Summer intern. And today we will be talking about the year's best military and adventure sci fi, Volume 4, featuring stories from Larry Niven, Jody Lynn Nye, Brad R. Turgerson, and a novella length short story from David Weber, For You Completionists, and more. Joining me today are authors Casey Ezel, Martin Shoemaker, Brian Trent, Susan Palmer, and our own Tony Daniel who promises to let me out of my cage this weekend. And David of Sharidad put the whole shebang together. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And for a little more detail about our guests, Casey Azel is an active duty United States Air Force helicopter pilot. When not beating the air into submission, she writes military sci-fi, sci-fi fantasy, and horror fiction. Martin Shoemaker is a programmer who writes on the side. 
He was the 2016 recipient of the Washington Science Fiction Association Small Press Award for his Clark's World story, Today I Am Paul, which also appeared in four different year's best anthologies and eight international editions. His work has also appeared in Analog, Galaxy's Edge, Digital Science Fiction, Forever Magazine, and Writers of the Future, Volume 31. Suzanne Palmer is a writer and artist who lives in the beautiful hills of western Massachusetts. Her short fiction has been nominated for both the Theodore Sturgeon Memorial and the UG M. Foster Memorial Award, and other short stories of hers have won both Asimov's and Analog Reader's Choice Awards. Brian Trent's speculative fiction appears in Analog Fantasy and Science Fiction, Orson Scott Card's intergalactic medicine show, Escape Pod, Pseudopod, Daily Fiction, Daily Science Fiction, Galaxy's Edge, Nature, and numerous Year's Best Anthologies. He is the author of historical fantasy series, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, Routep? Routep, yes. <laughs> Routep. And his novel, 10,000 Thunders, is slated for late 2018 publication from Flame Tree Press. And David, who has been on the podcast and has hosted the podcast many times, he is the editor of the year's best military and adventure science fiction anthology series. He has an MFA in creative writing um, from North Carolina State University. His short stories have appeared in various print and online markets. And, of course, we have our usual host, Tony Daniel. Now, for those who do not know, he is the senior editor here at Bain Books. Tony is the author of 11 uh, fantasy and science fiction novels, the latest of which is young adult fantasy, The Ember Arrow. His science fiction books include Guardian of the Night and two Star Trek novels. He is also an award-winning short story writer. Uh, Daniel has co-written screenplays for monster movies that appear on sci-fi and chiller channels, including the films Beneath and Flu Birds. In long ago, the 2000s, he wrote and directed numerous audio dramas for Sci-Fi.com, starring actors such as Stanley Tucci, Oliver Platt, Kira Sedgwick, and Lou Diamond Phillips. Daniel's nonfiction has appeared in The American Spectator, The Seattle Times, Stuff, Maxim UK, and The Stranger. Now that you've heard me talk for a while, let me just say that I've... I read the entire uh, anthology last week, and it was friggin' great. So once again, thank you all for being here, and I guess what I would like is just to get right into it. If you could just, each one of you could just tell us uh, the title of your story and a little bit of what it's about, and let's start with uh, Casey. Okay, so my story is called uh, Family Over Blood, and it was um, originally published in Michael D. Williamson's uh, Forged in Blood anthology, which is set in his Freehold universe. Um, my story is the um, the story of a human encounter uh, from the uh, the Freehold forces uh, encounter with a group of aliens and a basically a boarding action. And it's not a very survivable encounter for most people <laughs> who engage in it. But the uh, the theme of the overall anthology was that that there was a sword that. Um, you know, keeps reappearing, and uh, the one of the main characters of my story is is one of the bearers of that sword that um, runs throughout the Forged in Blood anthology. So, and Tony Daniel was in that anthology too, <laughs> which I guess is a great transition. Tony, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a wonderful anthology idea that Michael uh, C. Williamson had, which is that we follow a sword through time. It's sort of like the Red Violin, except for a sword, wow. and um, the people, the main characters in each of the story has some interaction, possesses the sword. And in my case, um, I wanted to do, I asked Michael if I could be in the anthology because I thought it sounded so cool. I asked Mike, and he said, yeah, sure. And then I dawdled around, and everybody got the early parts of the sword story, which would have been like free form, here's the sword when it was uh, in ancient China and stuff. And, and he gave me this slot that was right before it shows up in his novel Freehold, which necessitated and then became a great pleasure to reread his entire uh, series, the Freehold, um, and especially that novel Freehold, which I really, it, it's really a great just standalone novel in science fiction. And so this is sort of the prequel to when the sword shows up in uh, in that novel. So I wanted to do him right. And then I had this idea about the sword, about a, a warrior and this, this sort of uh, freehold military force named Lisa, 
who has been alienated from her parents, and they're not happy that she's joined and become an enlisted member of uh, of the armed forces. They have this long like tradition of officers, but she just wanted to to do that, and so they they made her buy her own sword, and so she bought this sword that that's been passed down for for ages, and she's on this like hellhole of a planet trying to fight fighting for her life. And uh, it, it's a very Iraq sort of uh, analog in in Mike's world, and or Afghanistan, something like that. But it's more urban, so I guess Iraq. Uh, and she encounters a local uh, fellow who is a uh, who's a evangelical Christian in a weird future projection of what a sort of evangelical sect would be, who she she falls for is she's totally like if not an atheist a, a polytheist um believer in uh, in the goddess uh, of of Mike's world so um they have this weird relationship where they don't share the same background or religion but they just fall in love anyway and i just wanted to sort of explore that in the context of, of war and so that's what the story's about basically and then there's a big battle um, at the end okay and your story is the lovers correct yeah All right, let's see. Suzanne, or is it Suzanne or Suzanne? It's Suzanne. Suzanne, apologies. Uh, tell us about your story. Well, my story is called The uh, Secret Life of Bot, and since I gave you the bio that you read earlier, um, it has been nominated for the Hugo, so yay, it's a very exciting yeah, year. Congratulations. Uh, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. Never thought that would happen. So that's very exciting. <laughs> My story is uh, essentially about a small, little tiny maintenance bot that's uh, very outdated, uh, and it has been woken up to take care of a pest problem on the ship that, unbeknownst to it at the beginning, is on essentially a suicide mission. And together with the other bots, they, they decide that they're not entirely willing to go along with with the, the plan as it stands. And that's really kind of what the story's about. <laughs> All right. And I meant to ask you about that story. Like, did those bots, how do they feel about the humans that they're serving? I understand that they, they're really not about the suicide mission. But how, yeah. how did they feel about the humans? You know, I, I sort of, in my mind, the, the humans are sort of such a distant concept to them. You know, they see them occasionally when they're underfoot doing things, but they're a step removed from them. You know, they talk to the ship, the ship talks to the humans, and I I don't think they feel, I mean, they, they understand that the, the sort of the chain of command comes down from the humans to the ship to them, but I think they feel their loyalty is to the ship and not so much to the humans. All right. Interesting. Okay, and Brian, can you tell us about your story, which I thought was particularly dark? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My story is uh, A Thousand Deaths Through Flesh and Stone, and it is about a special operative, a special ops from Mars, who is tracking down escaped war criminals. This, uh, the back story to the story is that a war has just occurred on Mars, Uh, particularly devastating, the nuclear attack. And Mars is putting itself back together. You know, a decade has passed. But uh, this is a future in which people can upload their minds, upload their consciousnesses, and download them to as many bodies as they want. What complicates this hunt is that you can hunt down an escaped war criminal, but maybe he or she has downloaded into multiple bodies. And the main character, in fact, uh, the, the first line of the story is, Sometimes I run into myself, and that's awkward. He's there with, a, with a, a version of himself that it has downloaded one week before he joined the hunt. I loosely based it on stories, apocryphal or not, um, of SAS officers in the wake of World War II who were uh, tasked with tracking down escaped Nazi war criminals who had managed to evade Nuremberg justice. So... Um, but this takes him into numerous bodies across numerous worlds. And the whole time, he's completely and, frankly, deliberately kept out of the loop. He's, uh, he's doing whatever they need, and they download him and, and continue, continue the quest. But there's a lot more. As you've read it, there's a lot more going on behind the scenes as well. That is a great first line, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you very, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that's I see that this story is kind of central to... Uh, I write a lot of stories in the same universe, and this is 
um, perhaps the core story um, in that universe. Yeah, I'm sitting yeah, over here green was, with envy going, man, why can't I think of anything that catchy? <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 I, it was, I, I'll speak for myself, I, I particularly vicious and, and I loved it. So, yeah. Thank um, you. <laughs> and that brings us to Martin, whose story is, yeah, tell us about it, because it was completely different from everything else in the anthology. Um, I, I kind of agreed that it was when I was asked, gee, would you, could this be in the anthology? I thought, okay, that fits the theme, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to object. Uh, it's a Hamal in Hollywood originally published in James Reasoner's, um, Rockets Red Glare anthology. And it's, it's, I guess, since it's military and adventure science fiction, I guess it's definitely adventure, but it's about as unmilitary as I think you can get. My protagonist yeah. is an immigrant Armenian hairstylist, very <laughs> proud of both her, her American citizenship but also her Armenian heritage, who gets herself unwittingly drawn into a interstellar conspiracy involving two different alien races on Earth and why they're here and why are they invading her hair salon at close of business on a late night. <laughs> I need my copy of this sooner because yeah. I want to <laughs> read, read all of these. <laughs> I'm thinking the same thing. <laughs> Sounds like I'm getting my because hair cut we, at the wrong salon. Sorry. Yeah, and also, like, you know, a hairdresser as a main character of a sci-fi story is not something we see often. We should see it more often, but... <laughs> well, th there's a story behind that. Those of you who have been to Writers of the Future are familiar, I'm sure, with the 24-hour story, where basically they give you a random item, and you read from a random book, and you interview a random stranger, and you're supposed to, in 24 hours, turn these into some semblance of a story... And I happened to, on my way out to fly out to Los Angeles, not have time to get a haircut. So I had to stop and get a haircut. And I suddenly realized there's a random stranger who has to talk to me for the next 20 minutes. And so that was my interview. And I struck hey. absolute gold with this ha Armenian hairstylist that just, when I heard her story, it was absolutely irresistible because she was the most wonderful, fun-loving, bubbly, friendly person around right up until the point that the TV happened to have a special on about the Armenian genocide because it was the 100th anniversary. And she switched like a flip, like she flipped like a switch had been flipped. She just immediately turned somber because that was still, that wasn't history for her. That was her family barely survived. And that became a significant element in this plot is how much that was still affecting this family and this woman a hundred years later. All right. That is, I did not expect that as the answer, but it is fascinating. <laughs> okay. And I guess before I go back into any of your stories, um, I want to ask uh, David um, about uh, putting the whole thing together. Yeah. So it involves a lot of reading, as you might expect. So uh, I try to pull from, you know, any source I can find. I read the, the big magazines. Um, I was very, you know, I think every year, we've done this, this is the fourth year now, and I think every year I've been very proud of what we put together. But I will say that some years I've had to do more digging to find great stories. This year I felt like it was almost too easy, like just everything fell in my lap. Um, Martin Shoemaker uh, mentioned that his story was in James Reasoner did an anthology. Uh, Reasoner is a Texas writer called Rockets Red Glare. That is American oriented space opera, you know. And the David Weber story we mentioned uh, was in an anthology called Infinite Stars that Titan Books put out. Uh, and the Jody Lynn Nye. So there was there was a lot of great material this this year. And again, not to say that the past years, I, I think they've all been we all. I've been really proud, like I said, but sometimes you have to dig. This year it was sort of like uh, things just fell from heaven a little bit, you know. So so you do a lot of reading. And Martin mentioned he he thought, you know, what is this doing in here? And I, I, I understand why he felt that way. I tried to 
you know, because we do have a pretty definite theme here, you know, it's not just a, a standard year's best that cuts across all of science fiction and fantasy. I still try to find things that have some, um, so the things are varied a little bit, you know, so they're not all just sort of in the heat of battle military stories, say, although we have some of those, obviously, or they're not just all, you know, so I try to put time travel or far future stuff in there so that even though you're reading a themed anthology year's best, you're not just hitting the same kind of space marine story every single time, although we definitely like space marine stories as well. Of course. And on that note, there's also a couple of stories here from uh, Larry Niven and David Weber. Can you tell us anything about them? Yeah, so the Weber story that I mentioned was in that Infinite Stars anthology. And, uh, you know, David Drake was in uh, the year, two years, the second anthology. And you know, we, we should mention, uh, maybe you were going to later, that we do a uh, reader's poll and give out an award. You can go online to uh, bang.com slash year's best award and vote for your favorite story from the book, and we announced that Dragon Con. You know, when David Weber won, or excuse me, David Drake won, I said, if you have a military year's best um, contest, you shouldn't be surprised if David Drake wins it. Well, I feel like that way with David Weber. Like, when David Weber's going to put out a new Honor Harrington, Honorverse story, um, it's going to have to really convince me not to put it in, and certainly this didn't. It was, uh, it's a great story. It's very, it's a novella, really. I think it's like 16,000 words, and it's what uh, closes out the uh, the book. So I think, I think it stands alone pretty well. I have read not all of the Honor Harrington stuff, but I'm familiar with it, but I think people who aren't will still find it to be a a good standalone tale. Uh, and then the Larry Niven story was in fantasy and science fiction. And it is a far future post-human almost sort of story, uh, which was not something I ever read much until I took Tony Daniels literature of science fiction and fantasy class. And we read um, a few of those and they really, since that time, I've really kind of had a deep interest and affection for those when they're done well. These really far out there weird stories. There was one in an earlier year's best uh, that was sort of like a murder mystery at the end of the at the heat death of the universe. This one takes place on gosh now I can't remember if it's Neptune or Pluto. One of the far flung planets and there's this consciousness, you know, this post human consciousness and then this robot, you know, AI shows up and they have to kind of work together to solve a, a problem. But, uh, you know, it's a great story, but what I love is just the, the bizarre out there world building and and uh, projection of what, what things might actually, you know, who knows if that will ever come to pass, but, you know, these sort of really far out there ideas. Um, so, yeah, that's that one. All right, thank you. And now I guess I would like to open up the discussion a bit. I would... Um, Really, about the process of, of making a short story, w what you can do with it in, in a medium like this compared to uh, writing a full novel, w uh, the things you're, you're trying to say, really just any of you, I would, I would love to know what you guys have to say about the process. Well, I, I, you know, I, I guess I'll, I'll start because it's quiet. Um, I, uh, I write novel-length work. My first novel comes out next year from DAW, but I write a lot of short stories, and I, I find that uh, short stories is, is a great opportunity to explore things more more fully and experimentally than you really can with a novel, uh, just because it's it's shorter. <laughs> and if you don't sell it, you haven't invested you know a huge amount of time and energy in it. For me, I tend to really I'm I'm what they call a pantser. Uh, I don't know if that's familiar terminology, but there's people who outline it and there's people who fly by the seat of their pants. So I started off um, with this idea of this little tiny robot that was sort of you know sort of Don Quixote-ish in terms of old-fashioned you know on a quest kind of thing, and sort of Moby Dick-ish. You know he's got some think he's got to go stop that he's obsessed with. In this case, it's it's this, this pest called a rat bug. And uh, honestly, part of the attraction of the story was to be able to call something a rat bug and get away with it. Because um, <laughs> uh, that, you know, that, that, make, that makes me happy. But uh, so it really just it sort of evolved from from 
you know, as it went very organically. And then you get to the end and you're like, well, hey, I have a story. I like it. And it's a mess. And then you got to go back and kind of kind of fix it. But for me, the, the short story process, it's very, um, it's much more sort of inspiration, spur of the moment, throw stuff in, see if it works, and then, and then fix it if you can, um, which is very different for me than from writing novels, which I really have to think a lot about because otherwise, you know, fixing something that's 8,000 words and, and a hot mess is uh, much less challenging than fixing something that's 100,000 words and a, and a hot mess, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, so yeah, so I, I, I really like the short story format just because of the sort of freedom it allows me. To, to kind of do what, try whatever I want, and not worry too much, at least at the outset, whether it's going to work at all. So that's that's my my take on the difference. Yeah, I <laughs> I think I you know I I agree that I really enjoy the short story format. It's uh, in a sense, it's easier for me. Um, some people tend to think in thousand word story arcs. I tend to think in single vignettes. Um, of, you know, a particular encounter that, that has some kind of emotional resonance or some kind of emotional impact. Um, and so for me, it's the short story is, it takes a lot less deliberate thought on my part. It's much more of a, hey, I have this, you know, I have this sort of flash of this vignette and it, it almost writes itself. Whereas, you know, when I'm working on novel length works, I, I have to, I have to have a series of those and, and then figure out how I'm going to string them together in a way that is coherent and is going to make sense. Yeah, and actually, uh, this is David. If I could jump in and ask Martin if he would be willing to maybe talk a little bit because his short story, Today I Am Paul, which we mentioned, which uh, was nominated and won all kinds of stuff, um, uh, he has turned into a novel or expanded into a novel which will be coming out from Bain. So I wonder if maybe he's got an interesting uh, and, you know, obviously he's not the first guy to turn a short story into a novel, but maybe some insight there because of that process. Well, and I do think that kind of I've already heard the big thing, the idea that for a panther particularly, it lets you lets you sort of go and explore an idea. And and I I like to think of it from the software point of view. In software design, we try to try to break problems down to pieces that will fit in your head all at once. And a small story can do that. A big story, that's a whole different matter. Today I am Paul was literally I had an inspiration in the shower one morning. I got in my car to drive to work and I dictated the story just stream of consciousness out of my head. There it was. I eventually ended up changing the last two paragraphs in response to beta reader feedback, but that all fit in my head. The novel didn't all fit in my head, and I had to learn these skills that you're talking about of of trying to get coherent over that longer stretch when it can't all fit in. It's going to fall out over time. So I, I had my agent basically beat me into submission that, no, you don't have to do an outline, but you need to... You need to know what your beats are. And as you beat that into my head, then I did a longer version of dictate it all, but I couldn't possibly do it all in one morning. But basically, I dictated 90,000 words over five weeks of driving back and forth to work. That's awesome, man. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, uh, this is Brian. I'm actually a pantser as well, um, trying to plot out stories just cause them to implode into a singularity. It's not very pretty. So I like to just dive into my stories uh, as well. But my story, A Thousand Deaths Through Flesh and Stone, kind of came about because, as I mentioned, I write in the same universe, a lot of my stories anyway, about 65% of my stories. And uh, the sequel to that story is actually in the current issue of Fantasy and Science Fiction. It's called Crash mm-hmm. Site. And in one of those continuous stories, a, somebody mentions to the main character that he they they're aware of an assassination mission that he had been um, that he had performed on on Luna on the lunar colony and he steadfastly denies that he goes I've never been to Luna he goes you know stories grow stories change you you got me confused with somebody else but I started it was just kind of a throwaway moment that I came up on the fly but then I started thinking about it. I'm like well this is a universe where people can upload and download them themselves 
those files can be edited. They're only as good as your last save. What if he was on the moon? And that story is this story, is A Thousand Deaths Through Flesh and Stone. He was there. Um, and that's how that came about. Cool. I could say about my story lovers that I uh, had had in my mind for years this, this uh, just to somehow write a relationship between an evangelical Christian and a heathen because I always because the idea of people falling in love who are utterly different people from completely different backgrounds has always interested me and I've I've done it, that sort of thing before in other stories um, particularly Life on the Moon which was uh, the my story back in the 90s the one the Asimov's Reader's Choice Award but I I just uh, had that that relationship in mind and the story grew from there and that was uh, entirely what I was thinking it, it grew from a kernel you can't really do that with a book as much um, all they can sometimes it it, it it's a different sort of uh, watering and growth process, I think, with short stories. That's about all I can say about it. All right. Anyone else? I was going to add that one of the the other perks that I see from writing short stories that I, you know, particularly I think is sort of a pantser thing, but I, I'm totally willing to be wrong on that, is that you do throw things in, and then later you're like, I could take that as a seed and write a whole new story at it, out of it, um, and. Right. Um, yeah, so so you can sort of almost have like a chain of, you know, I wrote this story, I had this minor character in the background or this minor event mentioned, now I can make a story out of that. Oh, but look, I threw some other little tiny character in there, and, well, they're really interesting, so let's go do something with them. And, yeah, I think there's a wonderful opportunity for just sort of um, serendipity when you have a chance to just sort of do what you want and not think too much about um you know, the the bigger picture as you're writing your first draft. Totally agree. Yeah. And I think that's the point that Brian hit, that in some ways it gets easier when when he's got that shared universe. When you've got this common background, you start knowing it better in your head. You start knowing all these things that happened before. So you're discovering opportunities for stories there that you couldn't have done until the earlier story planted that seed. Yeah. And and, on, and going off of that, we know, uh, several of the stories in this anthology are based off the uh, the Freehold universe, right? Yep. Uh, Tony's and Casey's are, yeah. And that so you have the entire mythology of something else, and then you what is it like putting your own spin on it? Well, you want to please Mike, but yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> contribute to the thing in such a way that that it's worthwhile for you to to have been one of the participants. And so you got to bring your own stuff to it. Yeah, absolutely. Right. But one of the things that was so cool about the concept of the anthology, the way Mike did it, was it, it wasn't just the freehold mythology that that it had started. Because the 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 story or the anthology traces the history of the sword over millennia, literally. Um, so it starts off in like pre medieval Japan or Korea, and and goes all the way through World War II. And then, you know, through the early days of, of space colonization and then to, you know, the colonization of the Freehold planet, specifically um, Grania. And then and in my story is the second to the most distant one in the future. Um, and so when when Mike gave me the, that slot to work with, basically what he told me was, look, this is, you know, what you've got is you've got um, uh, Freehold military forces in a boarding action against an alien species and I haven't made up anything about the alien species. So, you know, do what you gotta. And so it was, it was really cool because I was able to create this enemy species pretty much out of whole cloth and then just, you know, coordinate with Mike to make sure that it fit within his universe. And he was, he was really great to work with, but I think that, that the essential point there is that, you know, when you're doing that, when you're playing in someone else's backyard as it were, you just, you have to have, almost constant communication with them about, hey, you know, does this detail fit? Or um, if I say this, this isn't going to negate something that you've already written into your canon or anything like that. And Mike was thankfully really good about communicating that kind of stuff. Very, very cool. All right. Um, I guess we are about to run out of time. So before we go, is there anything any of you would like to say about the anthology or um, David, any last words? Um, I just want to thank everybody for um, obviously contributing. Uh, if you got a second, I might just mention 
what else is in here. Cause obviously we can't ha- I think there's like 15 or 16 stories. We can't have everyone on. We mentioned Larry and uh, Larry Nivens and um, David Weber's story. We've also got a Jody Lynn Nye uh, story in there that is um, part of her Lord Thomas Canago or Canago series, uh, the Imperium series. There's a um, story by this uh, writer named Edward McDermott, who um, very sadly passed away. I was trying to get in touch with him, and I couldn't, and I was kind of, it sounds terrible to say, but I was getting frustrated because I wanted to print the story. And then it turned out he had actually passed away. So I got in touch with his widow, and she was very happy to let us reprint the story. That takes place. It's a time travel um, back in World War One thing. And then there's a story called Hope Springs by Lindsay Burroker, which is part of a series that she's written, but it stands alone. Uh, it's sort of a fun action romp, I guess, on another planet. Brad Torgerson is in here uh, with a story called oh, Orphans of Ares, which was also in Rocket's Red Glare with Martin's story. Uh, that is a – basically, Americans are stranded on this sort of intergalactic way station because the governing bodies only want to deal with the UN, and America has left the UN. And so the American astronauts who were there when this treaty fell apart, they get stuck, and this guy's trying to get back home. Sort of called it A Man They Didn't Know by a writer named David Hardy, who uh, is sort of a space western. So if you like Solo or Firefly or uh, just westerns, you'll like that one, I think. Um, then there's a, a military story called Swarm by Sean Patrick Hazlitt, which is pretty short, so I won't say much about it lest I spoil it. There's a really weird, really gross, sort of <laughs> almost horror level bio ship uh boarding into this bio ship by Rich Larson called the Ghost Ship Anastasia. And then there's a little flash fiction piece called You Can Always Change the Past, which is I won't say anything about because it's, it would just ruin it because it's 200 words long. So um, just wanted to mention those since those folks couldn't, you know, we couldn't fit everyone on. And uh, like I said, I think this is as, as strong a co- uh, an anthology as I've had the pleasure to put together in the four years we've done this. So I uh, just want to thank everybody for Writing such good stories, making my job easy. So. <laughs> well, thank you for everything you're doing as well. Yeah, thank you. Well, for thank you very so much. much for yeah. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> thank you. All right. So once again, thank you for uh, all of you for uh, for coming and participating, and a special thanks to David for putting it all together. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. Great yeah, job, David. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> This is another entry in Alliance of Equals, a Leiden Universe novel by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Beset by the angry remnants of the Department of the Interior, and challenged at every turn by opportunists on their new homeworld of Sherbleek, and low on funds, Clan Corval desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, master trader Sean Yosgalen and Corville's premier trade ship, Dutiful Passage, is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with existing loops and secondary routes. But re-establishing trade and preserving the lives of the few remaining members of the clan aren't all of Corval's problem. Matters come to a head as Dutiful Passage, accustomed to being welcomed and feeded at those ports on its call list, finds itself denied docking and blacklisting while agents of the DOI mounted armed attacks on others of Corville's traders under the very eyes of port security systems. Traveling with dutiful trader on this unsettling journey is Patty O'Scalen, the master trader's heir and his apprentice. Patty is eager to make up for time lost due to Corville's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior, but she is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age, and perhaps her very life, is threatened by it. And here is the latest entry in Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals. They'd been right, of course, to strap in. And she should have done the same herself immediately, having issued general quarters. Now... She felt the tension in the bridge, read the distant hum of the crew's concern and fear, watched the screen as she moved quickly to her own chair to belt in. 
Anger flirted with annoyance in her. There was no need to threaten their child for some local chief's bid for celebrity. That was a true seeing, Priscilla knew. Feeling power rise in her, feeling Moonhawk watching over her shoulder where no one stood, helping guard the child unformed. She blinked away the sense of Moonhawk and returned to the streaming now of the monitor. The unpowered swarm of limpets was like snow on the screen, tumbling toward the passage and then jouncing in their movement as the ship's fields took hold, rejecting them, pushing most of them into odd arcs and bouncing some few directly away from the ship. Shall I arm weapons? Dilnem's inquiry brought a frisson of power again and a voice, not quite Sean's, a shadow, fingering a flashing counter. A blade loose too soon is a mistake with someone's blood on it. Moonhawk had bowed to that voice in another life. Priscilla nodded at the memory. No, she said to Dilnem, do not arm, that's what they want. Track, but do not arm. Images on screen showed a confusing disarray now the cutters breaking and evading the very minds with which they sought to entangle dutiful passage. Calm, she said. Broadcast these screens live on one channel and the replay of our contacts on another. Broadbeam it and send direct to the Trade Guild, the Pilots Guild, and to Langlast Port Authority. Add this. Priscilla sat straighter, took a deep, calming breath, and pressed the calm button. To all pilots, traders, travelers, and citizens of Langlast, this is Priscilla Delacroix y Mendoza Clan Corval, captain of Dutiful Passage, out of Shurbleek. Know that by my command, this ship is operating under high shielding, following an unwarranted stealth attempt by forces wearing the livery of Langlast Port Authority to compromise our security and safety by seeding our hull with remote activation bombs. To our knowledge, this attempt has been rebuffed. I post a hazard warning for shipping due to the ordnance now floating in near space. I add a caution for any ship piloting to Langlast Port. I post a request for a proper Pilots Guild civilian inquest into the events here. We await response from Langlast Port Authority and will continue to broadcast continuous feeds until such time as our security is not at issue. Captain out, she said. Message out on broad beam, Captain, Kick said. Orders? We wait, she answered. Our response to a hostility is shield, log, transmit broad beam. If we have no answer from Langlast Port Authority in 30 minutes, inquire again. If we see increased hostilities or another flight of bombs, rotate shields. Yes, ma'am. Priscilla released her belt, put her hands on the arms of the command chair, and sat back. The newly established link with Sean was gone, cut as cleanly as by a crystal blade. She snatched at their other connections, feeling each cut in turn swiftly, without care for the shock of being separated so quickly. The bridge wavered, edged in black. She closed her eyes, swallowing against nausea, seeing him a flash, a flare, before he vanished from her awareness. She widened her senses and caught his essence on the ether. Limbed in blood, star-bright courage, casting the very smallest shadow of fear. Danger. He was in danger. He needed her. The ship needed her. She was the captain, the very captain, seated on the bridge of her ship. Her ship, which was under attack. She had folk to care for. Priscilla breathed in calm, felt it distill into resoluteness. Sean was in danger. She could not reach him. She could not succor him. He himself had made certain of that. In fact, his actions recalled her to her duty. Another deep breath, 
while she regarded his signature, coalescing now, crimson outlines sharpening. Sean, she thought, was ready to do battle. Goddess bless you, my dear, she thought, and opened her eyes to the bridge. Patty pulled on sweater and loose pants, braided her damp hair, and wandered out into the common room on bare feet. Father and Mr. Higgs had not returned while she showered, and her glance at the clock this time was more worried than complacent. Perhaps she should call the kitchen and put dinner back another half hour. First, though, she would make a cup of tea. She crossed the room to the hot kettle, touched the button, and started its cycle. While the tea was brewing, she checked her pocket com for messages. Nothing. Well, she thought, frowning. She might call the desk to find if there were any messages there. Father did sometimes become involved in the trading, but Mr. Higgs would know that she had the ordering of dinner and would worry if they were over time. The kettle beeped, declaring its cycle complete, and the door chime sounded. Patty nearly dropped the teacup. She recovered herself, however, and set the cup gently on the buffet before looking at the clock and frowning at the door. Dinner. It must be their dinner, early by half an hour, which was quite the opposite of what was needed. Well, she thought, striding toward the door, they could simply take it back down to the kitchen and keep it warm, or... She snatched the door open and stood blinking at the two strange men standing on the threshold. They were Leadens, these strangers, and for one long moment they seemed as taken aback as she. Patty recovered first. She stepped back, starting to swing the door shut, and the stranger on the left thrust forward, got his shoulder in the door, and pushed it back hard. Come along, he said, making a snatch for her wrist. Your father sent us to bring you to him. She eluded his grasp, but her only retreat was into the common room, and they followed her, one swinging wide to her right while the other approached directly. Father would never send strangers to her, that was her first thought. Her next was that father had fallen into trouble on the port, despite the very capable presence of Vanner Higgs. Come with us, the stranger repeated. Your father sent us to bring you to him. Where is the token, she demanded. Father would have given you a token to prove you are friends. Yes, yes, the token. I have it right here. He reached into the outer pocket of his jacket and pulled out a gun. Patty didn't think. She reacted, kicking once to send the gun away, spinning to the right to sweep an arm out in a strike that broke the second man's neck, spinning again before he struck the floor to strike the first man. She botched the kill, though the blow brought him to his knees. She struck again, a solid kick this time, and he collapsed on the floor beside his comrade. Patty rushed across the room to close and lock the door. She turned toward the calm and stopped, every nerve frozen at the sight of a man who, a man who was not father, but who might have been father. He inclined his head politely from his lean against the buffet, and held up a sinewy brown hand, showing her the worn red game counter father often toyed with. You are formidable, he said, and I salute you. However, you should know that this pair has another as backup down in the lobby. If these do not appear soon, with you in hand, the second team will ascend to this floor after summoning their own backup. Patty blinked at him. I will call security to apprehend them. Security has been paid off. Then I will... She took a breath, not at all certain what she would do. Where is father? She asked the man who might have been him. Presently, very much engaged. He desires to keep you safe, 
and you may judge his state of mind for yourself, that he sent me to ensure it. He turned his head slightly and sighed. The backup team approaches. Listen to me, child. There are a number of these persons, and not even you can kill them all. I therefore counsel you to hide yourself, and swiftly. There is no place in the suite they won't find me after they break down the door. Nonsense. Use your wits. You have power, and you have a model. You can hide in this room and elude them still, but you must be quick. The doors moved as someone tried them, not gently. Paddy gasped and thought of her bowl, unbreakable and opaque. Excellent, said the man who was not father. Snatch it to and over you. She flung out her hands as if she could grasp the thought of her bowl, felt weight inside her head, knelt on the rug right there next to the buffet, and allowed the weight to settle over her. Well done, said the man who was not father. I can scarcely see you myself. What of you, she asked then. They will see you. But there was no answer. A heartbeat later, the door opened with a crash. Chapter 33 Admiral Bunter Tolly, I am a prisoner. Admiral Bunter sounded downright plaintive, Tolly thought. He was finishing up his last lap on the treadmill. He'd been of a mood to push himself hard, which didn't leave much breath left over for polite conversation. Well, fine. He'd talk to the boy about interrupting somebody while they were exercising in a couple minutes. Tolly, he held up a hand which the admiral would know for weight and gathered himself for the final sprint. Might have been he could have taken the conversation up during cool down, but the admiral didn't speak. So Tolly finished up in silence as he preferred stepped out of the machine and used his towel to mop up the worst of the sweat. I apologize, the admiral said, after Tolly had shaken his hair out of his eyes and looked up toward the ceiling fixture. I allowed my emotions to overcome me. I do know better than to interrupt an exercise program. I accept your apology. Tolly said, wondering if the admiral just made a leap, or if he'd previously interrupted Inky, or better, has, at exercise, and gotten an earful for it. Now, you were telling me that you're a prisoner? How's that work? You're a starship, an independent starship. You don't even have to clear your route with your crew. Don't like the present route? Change it, he shook his head. Don't sound much like being a prisoner to me. I cannot change my route, the admiral said. And yeah, definitely plaintive there. Inky Rani Yo has set a core mandate. I must deliver you to Nostrilia. I cannot change the course. I cannot deviate from the course. Hmm. I tell you what, I sympathize. I know exactly what that's like, having to do something somebody who isn't you wants done, and not having any say into whether or not that's actually something you do left to your own self. He paused and used the towel on the back of his neck. I'll allow that to be a prisoner, but look, it's not for long, is it? You go to Nostrilia, drop me off with the hiring hall manager, and you're done. You can go anywhere, take on crew or not. I do not know that, the admiral interrupted grimly. Tolly frowned. How's that? Inky set one core mandate, to deliver you to the representative of Lyre Institute on Nostrilia. How do I know if she has set another which will become active when the first mandate retires? 
It's a puzzle, all right, Tolly said sympathetically. You know, I'm starting to think that Inky wasn't entirely honest with us. The Admiral said nothing. Tolly dutifully counted out a slow twelve before he walked out of the exercise room, headed for his quarters and a shower. Inky has been dishonest, yes, the Admiral said, as Tolly moved down the hall. But Tolly, this means that we share a melanti. Does, doesn't it? He said agreeably, and wrinkled his forehead a little like he was thinking. Don't see that it does either of us any good, though. What do you mean? Well, he paused, his hand against the door to his quarters. Here's me, aboard a ship bound for Nostralia, and nothing I say or do is going to change that circumstance. And there's you, likewise bound for Nostralia, and nothing you can say or do is likely to change that circumstance. Yes, our circumstances are exactly alike. No, now that's where you're wrong. Tolly sighed and hung the towel around his neck before he looked up at the ceiling. See, when I get to Nostralia, I'll be taken off this ship and re-educated is what they call it. I've been so much trouble to the directors, I'm thinking I'll never surface as what I like to think of as myself ever again. Which is to say, he hardened his voice. I'll die. He shrugged. You, on the other hand, you'll be rid of the mandate that drove you to deliver me to my death. There might, or there might not, be another mandate lined up to take the place of the first one. You won't know until it does, or doesn't, set you in motion. Which is to say, you have hope, and I've got none. I have no hope, the Admiral told him. Inky is not a fool, and I have learned that AIs... I have learned that compliant AIs are a valuable commodity. Well, that's so, but I'm sure you'll figure something out. Tolly put his hand against the plate and his door slid open. We are fellow prisoners, the Admiral said forcefully. Tolly paused, sighed, and looked up. Even if I concede the point, what benefit accrues? to either of us, if we, if we join Melantes and forge a common goal, that of not proceeding to Nostralia as Inky has mandated, we may work together for our mutual benefit. I'll even concede that point, Tolly said gently. How do you think we're going to get around that mandate? I checked, and Inky wasn't fool enough to leave me my codes, or hers either. There was an extra long pause, finally broken by a small sound, as if Admiral Bunter had cleared his throat. There is an application which will generate a key set. Pause. It is not under my control, but it will generate such a key set for your use. With those keys, you will access the core, remove the mandate, and any others Inky may have left, and, and free us both to our own wills. What stops me from doing the same thing Inky probably did once I'm in the core? Tolly asked interestedly. I trust you, Admiral Bunter said, sounding as sincere as Tolly'd ever heard him. He stood there with the door to his quarters open and closed his eyes. On the one hand, he was touched. The boy had been listening, and he'd extrapolated the existence of the key app, which was no easy thing to do. On the second hand, and all other things being equal, he'd personally rather survive this episode intact and at liberty. And once he did what the Admiral asked, He'd go from savior mentor to clear and present danger so fast it'd make his head spin. I'll tell you what, 
he said softly. That's a real interesting proposition you got there, and I'm interested in it. You will deactivate the mandate. Don't go generating any keys yet. I'm interested, is what I said, but I gotta think, which we both know takes me a deal longer than it does you. So, what I'm gonna do is take a shower and have a meal while I'm thinking this out. After my meal, if that fits with your schedule, we'll talk again. It was a little cruel, considering the disparity between human hours and AI hours, but he was tired and sweaty. Coming on to Hungary and Nostrilia was still days in their future. Plus which, he did have to think, fast and smart, as he ever had. Thank you for your consideration, Admiral Bunter said. So he'd accessed protocol, good lad that he was. I will be happy to talk with you after you have refreshed yourself. Excellent, Tolly said, letting all the warmth the design had in it infuse his voice. See you in an hour. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruf Jotkowitz and a special back rub from the many tentacled old ones who watch from above and just want you to have a good day on your way to the ever-yawning abyss to editor David of Sharirad Brian Trent, Suzanne Palmer, Casey Azel, and Martin Shoemaker, and our own Tony Daniel, all part of the year's best military and adventure sci-fi, Volume 4, now at Bookseller. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. Stars.